Thank you. I didn't recognize myself. I was going to about to sit down again then. <laughs> Welcome. What I want to tell you about is, well, how often, perhaps, have you heard it said, anything's possible? Perhaps you yourself have said, at times, anything's possible. This might be a pool like I've read of in books, connected to one of those underground brooks, an underground river that starts here and flows right under this bathtub, and then who knows? It's possible. Anything's possible. There. <laughs> Anything's possible, they say. But really, is everything possible? Is there nothing that is utterly impossible in the world that we inhabit? Um, the thought is, there are things that we might think cannot be with certainty. But really, is that possible, or do we just throw up our hands in doubt? <laughs> Modern thought, then, begins with Descartes. But modern thought on certainty, or rather its absence, began with Berkeley. Berkeley, when writing in 1710, in his treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge, wrote, anyone who considers what we know can see that all we know are ideas we get from the senses, smell, taste, etc." When several of these ideas always accompany each other, they are called by one name and so considered to be one thing. Thus, for example, he would write, the smell, the figure, the consistency of one thing always seem to come together and we give it one name, let's say the name apple. But, say you, perhaps all that you see is in your mind that Everything really exists, but it is the mind that simply gets the idea, and what you see simply copies the reality, the reality of the apple. I answer, he says, you can only compare ideas. So I say to you, well, look, I see an apple, but so what? It's only in my mind. Well, you can tell me you see an apple too, but so what? It's only in your mind as well. In other words, anything's possible. But it was not always this way. Thought began with certainty. The time, 2,500 years ago, and you are there. You look one way, and then you look the other way. And then you look up, and you think, Tiesti, or what is? What is? all of this. Is all this real? When I, look at, when I look at substance, do I see things changing or not? Do I see things, the, the leaves on the tree changing, or is it my senses, actually, that are deceiving me? Is substance permanent, in other words, or is it changing? And if it's changing, what causes change? Democritus was the first to offer an answer. He said, everything is real, everything is substance, and substance is both permanent and changing. Despite the appearance of change, he said, there is permanence. A permanent substance is the basis for change, and these permanent substances he called atoms. And atoms are Par particles that are permanent, and change is the rearrangement of those. What he wrote was, by agreement sweet and by agreement sour, by agreement hot, by agreement cold, but in reality, everything atoms and void. In other words, there is substance, it is real, we can be sure of it, and everything else is just your opinion. It's too hot in here, too cold in here, the apple's sweet, Immaterial. All that matters is that there is a reality between all of this. But how can you know this to be the case? Plato offered an answer. Plato said, you know 
when you can give a reason. When you add rational explanation, then you know, and knowledge is certain. Certainty is all about the explanation. Certainty is all about the reason. Barclay would have none of this. Barclay would say, you don't know. All you know is what's in your head, and no reason at all is valid. So you might be walking along, and you might be walking, and you might see two people, and they're your friends. And you might say, hello, but really, how do you know that they look like that? It's all in your head. It's just an idea. Perhaps these are your friends. <laughs> and perhaps, perhaps you're a lizard. Perhaps I'm a lizard. Perhaps we're all lizards, <laughs> Barclay would say. All you know is what's in your head. Perhaps we're all green, and there's something in our eyes that changes the greenness so we look as we are. And there's something in our touch so that as we touch, the softness goes, the, the scaliness goes away, and we feel softness. We don't know anything's possible. But around this time, science marched on as the Enlightenment began, and Robert Boyle, the first of the modern chemists, began chemistry, a new philosophy whose purpose was to explain substance. But here's the thing. Nobody cared whether they were sure of it. It was just a model. These atoms seem to work. That's all we care about. But whether it was truly true was of no consequence whatsoever. Time marched on 200 years later. Kekulé, in studying molecules, said, you know, the only way I can explain data is if the structure of the molecules, the carbon, must have four bonds to it. That there's a carbon atom, and it must form, form bonds to it. But he didn't consider it important whether there really were these atoms, just that the data fit. He wrote, the question whether atoms exist or not has but little significance from a chemical point of view. Its discussion belongs rather to the field of metaphysics. In chemistry, we only have to decide whether the assumption of atoms and molecules fits the data. That's all that matters. Molecules were simply a symbolic language. A little while later, Van Hooft and Lebel introduced something that was quite revolutionary. What they said was, yes, we agree carbon must form four bonds, but the four bonds must be in the form of a tetrahedron. Now, this introduced the concept of atoms as three-dimensional entities. And this was more that, than most chemists could accept. Herman Colby, a brilliant chemist with many important discoveries, wrote, the tetrahedral geometry was a fantastic foolishness and an overgrowth of the weed of seemingly learned and ingenious, but in reality trivial and stupefying natural <laughs> philosophy. Since reality at a molecular level cannot be experienced, it cannot be known. But soon after, chemists accepted this three-dimensional view of molecules, but again, they accepted it only insofar as it was a symbolic language. Nobody gave it any thought, was this really real? The question still remained, what is all of this? And there was still doubt that we could ever know anything with certainty. John Dewey, writing as late as 1929, wrote, the existence of ultimate, unchangeable substances are pure dialectic inventions. Bertrand Russell, writing a bit later than that, was also put a, a very unique point of view to it. And he said, our minds are hardwired to see shapes. We don't know that there's a cube or that there's really such a thing as a sphere, but our minds are hardwired to see things the way they are. To put it in more modern terms, it's all about the spectacles. If you always wore blue spectacles, you could be sure of seeing everything blue. But we have no reason to suppose that anything analogous is true of things in themselves which we do not experience. It's all about the spectacles you're wearing. It's all about the mind's operating system. What we see, we see just because we're hardwired to do that. And yes, I know operating systems are not hardwiring, but you get it. It's a little poetic. 
It's all about the spectacles. <laughs> but what if you change spectacles, is what I want you to consider now. What if we could change the operating system in our minds as easily as we can go from a PC to a Mac to a Linux? What if we could possibly do that? And that's what I can ask you to consider now, that you change your minds. How? By technology. Technology provides the new spectacles. Instruments are the new spectacles, each with their own mathematics, each with their own internal logic. And now the question is, do they give you the same answer? Well, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. You write a structure for a molecule, you get a series of lines. The only way those lines can be true is if it is the molecule that you just wrote. X-ray crystallography, you get a series of dots. The only way those dots can be true is if it has the structure that you imagined it to have. Mass spectrometry, you put some of the substance in there, you get a series of lines. The only way those lines can be there is if you were right in writing the structure for the molecule that you did. I, I mean, wow. <laughs> this is something. And so where are we now? Well, once upon a time, we had a clear liquid. We realized that the clear liquid was different from water, so we gave it another name. Let's call it benzene. Then we figured out it has six carbons and six hydrogens. Then we figured out that the only way you can fit six carbons and six hydrogens together is if it looks something like this, but not quite like this, more towards like this, those electrons going around, it seemed, in a circle. So we call this benzene, and eventually, with our mathematics, we figured out, OK, it's because of these two p orbitals that are there that it's all going around in a circle. But really, still, how do you know? And the answer is, change spectacles. Infrared spectrum, a series of lines. The only way those lines can be true is if it has the structure. Nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum, you get a single line. The only way that line can be true is if you have the structure indicated. Mass spectrum, the only way those lines can be true, again, the same answer. No matter what spectacles you put on, you will always get the same answer, which is an amazing coincidence if the substance is not exactly what you think it is. How can you possibly doubt it then? This is the thesis of certainty with all of these lines. Oh, I'm detecting a little bit of doubt, I think. <laughs> oh, this is a shame. This is a shame. This is a shame. Me, one more time. OK, no, really, one more time. Substance is black stuff. <laughs> we eventually figured out that the black stuff is called pentacene. Gave it a name. It's not charcoal. We eventually figured out that it had 22 carbons, 22, uh, 14 hydrogens. Kekulé's idea is that it has to look like this. It's the only way it can fit. The infrared spectrum, those lines can only be true if it has that structure. X-ray diffraction pattern, the only way those lines can be true is if it has that structure. Mass spectrum, the only way it can be true if it has that structure. Now, come on, come on, please. You must believe with all of this that it is as it is. <laughs> One more experiment. I'm going to take this atomic force microscope. I'm going to put a little bit of that pentacene in there, and let's take a look. Let's take a look through the lens. What? It has a structure. You are now seeing it. You are now experiencing it. And if you pull the lens back, you can see the individual molecules as clearly as you would see the caterpillars on a tree, which they so clearly resemble. What you then have here is a structure that it is exactly the same structure that Kekulé imagined in 1857 as it had to be true just by imagining where it all comes together. Can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah <laughs> with all of this then? Surely so. You have now seen. You have now seen ideas from Democritus to Adams to the tetrahedral structure to Pentacene itself. Substance equals atoms, molecules, change is their rearrangement. This is knowledge about nature, and this knowledge, I would propose, 
is certain. There is no alternative to it. Each of the spectacles gives the same answer, and so if the search for knowledge were to be a baseball game, the score would be Plato one, Barkley nothing. <laughs> and remember Dewey? The existence of ultimate unchangeable substances are pure dialectic inventions. Yes, well, dialectic inventions indeed. And in the second game of the doubleheader, the final score is Democritus one, Dewey nothing. And so, we now come full circle. Back to the start. You know when you give a reason. When you add rational explanation, then you know, and knowledge is certain. Certainty is all about the explanation. It's all about the reason. In the search for knowledge of all that we see, the esti, what is, the rational explanation is atoms, and its origin is in rational thought. Everything is not possible. There are limits to how the universe operates, and those limits are placed by atoms and their interaction. And so, now with atomic force microscopy, we can actually see the individual atoms and can manipulate them with the probe, such as we now see how silicon goes together in a field of tin atoms. It is as it is, it is demonstrated, it is necessary, and it is certain. <laughs>